You know, when your baby cries, you cannot possibly concentrate on this memo you're trying to write for work. Like, no, forget about it. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Fierce and Flawless, The Female Project. I am Dr. Antonella Kaler and I am on a mission to find out exactly what it takes to build an indestructible foundation and achieve our best reality. I am thrilled to bring you stories of inspiring women who were fierce and relentless when pursuing their passions, who did not blame their struggles on so-called character flaws, and who took control to lead extraordinary lives. If you're a woman who is tired of feeling like your life is merely a product of cause and effect, and you are ready to be the woman that causes the effect, keep listening to learn the necessary insights to navigate life's toughest challenges, break through the most disheartening plateaus, and unleash your inner alpha woman. And don't forget, you have the exclusive opportunity to win our Alpha Empowerment Book Bundle. It's three life-changing books whose authors you heard speak on the show and a 12-week wellness program by me. So please visit www.thefemaleproject.net slash podcast to find out exactly what you need to do to participate. So good luck and thank you for listening. Hello, Alphas, and welcome to another episode of Fierce and Flawless, The Female Project. Today, I had the absolute privilege of talking to Dr. Jane Reed Thompson. Now, Jane is the executive director of the TD Scholarship Program, which gives away millions of dollars annually to young Canadians. She's also a mother, a PhD, and a published author. She literally wrote the book on female resilience. Now, Jane shared a treasure trove of insights, so keep listening as we talk about the challenges of trying to balance it all as a modern woman and some practical strategies to make this daunting task a little bit easier. I bring you a true alpha woman, Dr. Jane Reed Thompson. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk to me. I know you're an extremely, extremely busy woman balancing so many aspects of life, which uh, your mastery of that is one of the reasons that we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> So let's start with uh, how you found your passion. Well, I I have a slightly wiggly road, and I actually think that's true of lots of women. And it's one of the things that we find a little hard to accept, because I think lots of us, um, as teenagers and even into our early twenties, we think, oh, it's going to be a straight road, and I'm just going to I'm going to start here, and I'm going to scale that mountain, and it's all going to be easy. Um, and exciting and but straight, but straightforward <laughs> and uh, yeah, not straightforward at all. So I started along that path. I went to business school and did, you know, did my degree in four years and was very excited to talk to on-campus recruiters and in fact found this, what I thought was a very glamorous job in advertising. Um mm-hmm. And I moved, I got the job and I moved to the big city and this was fantastic. And then it turned out, I really didn't like advertising very much. On the upside, what I really liked about it, it's full of very smart people Mm -hmm. and it's fun because they're not only smart, they're creative. So Mm -hmm. that part was great. It was very hard work, like 60 to 80 hour weeks were absolutely normal. And, you know, I was selling dog food and canned soup and I just, it, it didn't really thrill and excite me to be trying to work that hard to sell dog food and canned soup. (laughs) So I went back and did what I tell lots of people to do. I read that classic book, What Color Is Your Parachute? Mm -hmm. Which is all about this question we're talking about is how do you find your passion and figure out what you're really interested in? And The first time through the book, I said to my mother, I think I'm in bad trouble because what I really like to do is sing and dance and party. And I think maybe that means I should be a stripper and I I don't think I should be a stripper. So now where am I? But anyway, I went through it again and really thought about it. And in fact, what has always kind of made me get out of bed in the morning is the status of women in the world. And how women are doing and why it should be after all this time that that maybe women are still not doing quite as well as they should be. 
So I thought about that and scratched my head and talked to a bunch of people I knew. And to do the kind of work I wanted to do, a business degree was not really going to cut it. So Mm -hmm. I went back to school and I did another, a second undergraduate in women's studies. Mm -hmm. And then I decided I really did like university a lot. Mm -hmm. So I went on and did a master's and a PhD in women's history. Wow. And along the way, so that was, and, and I enjoyed it hugely, and I really do like studying and, and thinking about the origin of situations and problems and how you might get to a solution. Um, but along the way, I had also found my partner, and we had had a baby, and at that point in academia in Canada, it's probably still true now, if I was really going to get a job as a professor, I would have had to travel all over, you know, and teach in Northern BC or teach in Newfoundland, you know, for right. a few years. And that just was not going to work with, with mm-hmm. my life situation. Um, so the funny thing is, and you know, a little bit of, of this story, um, I, there are kind of two streams to, well, more than that, but two streams to my professional life. Mm-hmm. One of them is pursuing this question of what's going on with women in their lives and how do we make it better. And the other one that I honestly sort of fell into is that I give away scholarships for a living. Yes. It's a big Canadian bank. And yeah. that has been, I've been doing that for the last 18 years. Mm-hmm. It's really incredible. And the great thing about oh, it's it, life changing. It, yeah. yeah, it is life changing. And we're looking for young people who already at the age of 17, show signs of understanding how you create social change Mm -hmm. and how you bring other people along and how you transform the community around you. So that's just incredible because instead of just being one person trying to make the world slightly better, now through this program, uh, I'm lucky enough to help a whole lot of other people do that. So there's this incredible sense of leverage and magnification and as I said at this point I already had uh, my son who was Mm -hmm. six he was going into grade one when I started work I finished my PhD and started this job so all the time in the back of my mind was sort of this simmering question of women Mm -hmm. and what I really found partly through the work I was doing in my PhD but also just in my own life and the life of women all around me, was this unbelievable shock that we were this generation. We came of age, my older sisters came of age in the 70s, -hmm. I came of age in the 80s, and we thought, well, wow, it's going to be totally different for us than our mothers, because I was raised in a very middle class household. My mother didn't work outside the home, Mm -hmm. and neither did any of the mothers of any of my friends. Mm -hmm. So we thought, okay, well, we're not going to be housewives. We're going to get out there and have jobs, but we're also going to have kids. And of course, it's just going to be no problem. And (laughs) then, of course, (laughs) we experienced the same thing I think you have, that um, it was a huge shock. It was a lot harder than we thought. Oh, yeah, nothing nothing quite prepares you. (laughs) Like, you know, even if you're around other families with kids, you don't understand that this is going to be a full-time consumption of your existence, which is going to be wonderful and rewarding, but all of the other priorities are really going to take the back burner. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think one of the things that is amazing and wonderful about the time we live in, but also contributes to this situation, is that girls and boys are now brought up in North America anyway, in very similar ways. And Mm -hmm. we have the same access to school, which is fantastic. And when I was in secondary school, you know, it was just as likely to be a girl as a boy who ran the student council and was Mm -hmm. the president of this club or that club. And there were lots of athletic teams for girls. And we all went off to post-secondary in the same way. And I had friends in law school and medical school. And we all just... It it really was, it seemed like that feminist heaven where, you know, gender really didn't matter very much at all. Mm -hmm. And that kept right on really through a lot of our 20s. We had these very egalitarian marriages and everybody was chipping in with the cooking and the shoveling snow and everything. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, 
you, you know, and people even, I remember men I worked with saying, oh, yes, my wife and I are pregnant. Yes. It's like, well, dude, you know, no, <laughs> your wife's you. pregnant and you yes. are not. <laughs> and it, um, it was such a, I call it cognitive dissonance, right? Like you've, mm-hmm. you've spent all these years, 30 years of your life thinking, me and my brother, we're just having the same life. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, no, no, you're not because you're pregnant and your partner is not pregnant. <laughs> and it's really, really different. And that one, I think, I think that is the, that first big seismic shock that you've been talking about. So what would you say your uh, top piece of advice is uh, for a woman that's uh, ready to get back into the workplace, both at home and uh, to make the transition back to work? Well, you know, it's tough. And I I started out kind of writing and thinking in this area, really hoping I would come up with an answer. And (laughs) what is the one set solution to all of our problems? And, you know, they're really, they're just so isn't one. I think what I, I really came up with, which of course people have been have been writing on the topic of resilience for the past 10 years, and I just found it such a useful um, idea that it's not that you are never going to get knocked down. Mm-hmm. That that is not that should not be anybody's ambition here, that they can be perfect on all fronts. It's that you need to sort out how to have the the resilience to bounce back, to get back up again from whatever the challenge might be. And thinking a little bit about that, about what is it that enables you to to snap back from whatever challenge arises. um, I think that's really important. And I think it's, it's another thing that when you're 17, if you don't eat right, or you don't get any exercise for a month, or you don't get any sleep three nights running, it doesn't matter. Nothing happens. Nothing. Happens. Your body's unbelievably forgiving. <laughs> Your body is so forgiving. And, you know, by the time lots of us are around 30 when we have our kids, and it's just not true. And one of the things that I thought about a lot was mm-hmm. the idea of a, a personal ecosystem, which mm-hmm. is, you know, what are the inputs and what is it that you're trying to get as outputs? And, you know, the inputs really pretty much, in my mind, are time, money, and energy. And those things are trade-offs. And if you can recognize the trade-offs, maybe you only have this much time, but you can save some of it by spending money on childcare or pre-made dinners or getting somebody else to do your laundry or whatever it might be. If you've got the money to do that, you get back a little bit of your time. Those two things are kind of fixed in the short term. And when I first started writing about this, because I was pretty tired myself, (laughs) I saw energy as another fixed thing. But, you know, the longer I've worked in the field and the more people I have talked to, the more I've come to realize, no, energy is actually more flexible than the other ones. Because if you're not taking care of yourself and you're not getting enough exercise and all of those things, then you don't have as much energy as you could. And it doesn't, and I mean, you know all about this because of, of, you know, your professional knowledge. It doesn't actually take that long of eating a little bit better, sleeping a little bit better, getting some exercise for that to really pay off. So that's, to me, that's incredibly important. And I know, you know, I can hear lots of the women that I've interviewed going, are you out of your mind? (laughs) You know, I've got a baby. When do you think I have time to exercise? You know, it's like when they tell you on an airplane about the oxygen mask scenario, that the fact that you're putting the oxygen mask on yourself first doesn't mean that you're selfish in any way towards your family. It means that you're making sure that you can be a functional person as a member of your family. Yeah, absolutely. I I agree with you completely. And also, as your kids get a little bit older, you're also modeling that behavior for them. And also you need to have some clear boundaries Mm -hmm. because demonstrating for your kids that they can walk all over you and demand 24 hours of your time and attention, it's not really doing them any big favors right? because either they will learn to let other people do that to them Mm -hmm. or they will expect that other people are infinitely available to them. And, you know, we know that's not true. Of course. Um, So, yeah, that's what I think. And I think it, it's frustrating to hear it, but 
there are people over the years who have said, you know, you can't have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. <laughs> and there's a certain amount of, of truth in that. Lots of the women I talk to, especially women in the professions, lawyers in particular, they're so trained up to be focused on success and success is defined in certain kinds of ways. There's this idea that there's only one way to do this job and there's only one standard of success. Mm-hmm. And so this is what a successful human being looks like. And they work all the time and they're available 24 seven and, and all that stuff. But actually I have come to the conclusion that in some of those workplaces in what were male dominated industries. Mm -hmm. What they really want you to be is a pretty good facsimile of a man. So you think that we're all the same, but you're only the same as long as you're acting like a man, really. And I I know women on all parts of that spectrum and some of them, you know, they bail and they go find a more sympathetic work environment. And I also know other women who stick And they hire three nannies, you know, and have both Mm -hmm. grannies involved and they do it that way. And it doesn't necessarily mean one thing, one way is correct and the other way is wrong. It's an individual choice. That is absolutely, key point. (laughs) It's an individual choice. Everybody's going to make a different decision. And also what is right for you will change over time. I think it's really tough in some careers where there seems to be a very rigid timeline. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you don't get an articling job, then you're not going to get that entry level job and you're not going to be able to write your bar exams and, you know, boom, boom, right. boom, boom, boom. Um, but really mostly the only thing you know for sure is that your kids are going to grow up. You cannot stop your children from growing up. <laughs> so that's the, to me, that's the one you got to pay attention to because (laughs) your law career or your anything career um, will be there in one form or another when you get back to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But your kids will not have waited for you. A lot of us are a little, uh, are are pretty bad at that, (laughs) especially if, especially if you are more a career driven woman and you're, you know, a pathological overachiever, Mm -hmm. it's, it's mentally very difficult to say, no, you know what? I need to take a step back. I need yeah. a little bit of time. It's uh, it's it feels like it's going against the grain of your entire being. <laughs> Absolutely, and there's not there just isn't a lot of support for it. And mm-hmm. I think the challenge is so many women now are saying, "I think I'm going to try this part time. I'm mm-hmm. going to try this freelance." And of course, the whole economy sure. is going gig and freelance, mm-hmm. which is terrific. And it does give you a lot of flexibility. There are real advantages to it. I think part of the problem though, is that you feel like everybody disapproves of you all of the time. (laughs) You know, you, you walk your kid to school and the full-time moms all are kind of giving you the side eye because they're not sure who you are, or at least you think they are. Mm -hmm. And you go to work, but you're going to leave at 2 PM because that's your deal. Right. So everybody else in the office, you think, is kind of looking at you like, really, you're leaving at two o'clock? So I think there's that's a, a struggle, mm-hmm. um, is to really say to yourself, I'm, I'm okay. I am making good choices. <laughs> now, do you have any kind of uh, methods to kind of help with that mindset shift? I once heard somebody give a lecture about raising children with serious learning disabilities. And they were talking about a a research study that had been done and they laid out this very elaborate 10 point intervention. I came away from it realizing, okay, so there's no single silver bullet here. Right. It's just a little bit of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really true about this situation too. We would all love, I think we all have this feeling if I just found the right job, Maybe if I just work 32 and a half hours a week (laughs) instead of 40 hours, that would be perfect. You know, or if I find the perfect caregiver, Mm -hmm. but that's, that's not true. No one thing is going to fix it. So I'm very big on the kind of the 10 point plan. And to your point, it's all of those things. It's taking care of yourself and it's journaling and it's meditating (laughs) and it's going out with your girlfriends and keep your eyes on the prize. Like just keep, trying to envision, you know, remember, where am I now? Where is it that I want to get to? 
the, the more clearly you can keep that in mind, the stronger the, the pull of the rubber band <laughs> between your current state and your future state, mm. it, it just gets easier because every time something comes up and challenges you, and I'm sorry I've forgotten the name of the guy who wrote the book, but it's about the idea of gremlins. Mm -hmm. And the gremlin is that voice in your head that tells you you will never do a good job of anything. Every time that gremlin voice pops up and says, you are such a loser, you know, you, you bought the cupcakes for the birthday <laughs> party, you didn't make them, you know, or, oh my God, you're a terrible human being because you, you completely blew this Halloween costume. Like whatever that is, <laughs> it's, it's nice to have that answer for the gremlin of the reason I made this choice is for this long-term goal. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why I made this choice. And the other one that I absolutely love, I just have to tell you this story. There used to be a guy on CBC named Peter Zosky. He ran a contest once mm -hmm. saying that in the United States, there was this saying as American as apple pie. And he wanted his listeners to call in with how they would fill in the saying as Canadian as blank. Oh, and okay. they, it, was, it was lots of fun, you know, and they heard yeah. all kinds of things. And there were, you know, butter tarts and maple syrup and everything sure. you might expect. And the winning entry was as Canadian as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> And it's just, it says some, isn't that great? Just, and I think it says so much about what is wonderful about Canadian culture. But I also think it's a great thing for women to think about when they're having a real moment where it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to be resilient. I'm trying to bounce back, but I'm down here like on the ground, like an egg or a baseball, you know, I am not bouncing back like a tennis ball to tell yourself I'm doing as best as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> and just that be a little me, kinder to yourself. Be a little kinder to yourself. It really, that has gotten me through a lot. I have to tell you. No, it's, uh, and uh, I like um, this little strategy, uh, which I'm sure is very, very popular in life coaching. And it's like, you know, anytime that you start on a stream of negative self thoughts, mm -hmm. of just try to think, okay, you know what, if it was my friend coming to me with this problem or saying, you know, I screwed up, I did blank, would I be telling them the things that I'm saying to myself right now? Would I dare? <laughs> Like that it's is terrible. brilliant. That is brilliant. <laughs> and what I find amazing is it's like a little um, gerbil wheel. You know, you sometimes I'll be, I don't know, doing the dishes. And I will realize I'm five or ten minutes into this train of thought before I'm even aware of it. And that thing that meditation gives you, right, that distance where you re you become aware you're having this strain of thought and just to back up a little bit and say, oh, look at that. So, it, yeah, we all have to, I think, in addition to kind of, you know, our cardiovascular fitness and <laughs> strength training and all those good things, exercising those mental muscles of noticing where our thoughts are taking us and all the rest of it is tough. And I think the other piece of this that I want to get to that we don't talk about much because it's not very stylish in feminist circles mm -hmm. um, is, you know, the hormones that go along with being a mother are among the most powerful thing on earth. So, oh, absolutely. you know, when your baby cries, you cannot possibly concentrate on this memo you're trying to write for work. Like, no, forget about it, <laughs> you know, because all of human development and evolution is set up to make you drop whatever you're doing and pick yes, your baby and up. Run. <laughs> run. Get over there, run. run. It, that one's tough. And I remember when I was in grad school, there was a guy a few years ahead of me describing how, you know, he'd been working and the kids were sort of playing with their toys on the floor in front of him. And it worked fine. I was gobsmacked. Like my mm -hmm. jaw was on the floor. I thought I could no more work on my dissertation with my toddler crawling around in front of me, then fly to the moon. <laughs> I just thought, oh, okay, we are just, you know, never mind. 
yeah, different genders. We are like members of a different species here. <laughs> Uh, so I think lots of that stuff, part of the challenge is, for all I l totally love modern society and wouldn't change practically any of it, um, I think girls are brought up to think they should be like that, that they should be rational and non-responsive and, and all of that stuff. And then when you get into motherhood, and by the way, I completely, I have watched this with my friends. This applies to uh, uh, women who have adopted babies as well. Like, mm -hmm. this is not just about biological motherhood. It's just, yeah, it's how we respond to children. So I don't think we should get rid of that. The other thing that's tricky um, is I sometimes don't even realize how fortunate I am. I went through school with five other women. There's six of us. We're still friends. We've been friends for 40 years. So I have that very solid group, and I have three sisters. So I have this amazing uh, ability to talk to other women about the experiences I'm having. But every once in a while, I'll run into somebody who says, well, I just, you know, I don't really have women around me I can talk to. And that would be, that's a, that is for me, a gold plated piece of advice. If you don't have women you can talk to who are sharing your experiences, go find some, you know, there are mom's groups around and there are the parents at school. And, you know, these people may not be your best friends for the rest of your life, but oh my God, but between when you first have kids and those kids are, you know, five, six, seven, ten 10 years old, man, you, you just need a lot of other moms around. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Now, uh, as we are sort of wrapping up on yeah. our uh, time here, uh, is there a book that you would uh, like to recommend? Is it What Color Is Your Parachute? Or is there another life-changing well, book that you think people should have a, definitely have a read of? I'd say a few things. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, what well, Colors Your Parachute is great if you're trying to figure out, you know, what to do with your life. Mm -hmm. um, if you're really thinking about these questions, what I would say is, first of all, do not read Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In. It's, okay. it's just the worst advice I've ever read in my <laughs> life. But after that book came out, Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote two things. If you, if you really like to read, the book is called Unfinished Business. Mm -hmm. women, men, work, and family, but all you really need to read, and this is good because moms don't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> she wrote an article in the Atlantic called why women still can't have it all. Mm -hmm. And to me, that just gives you permission to be less than perfect. And she's pretty perfect. She was working, I think in the state department under mm -hmm. in the Obama administration. And it was just too much. And she describes how it's too much. Now, her idea of kind of stepping back is to return to her life as a tenured professor at Princeton. So she's, you know, a very <laughs> accomplished person. But never. So that's just that. a fallback, right? That's, that's like just a fallback. Her fallback. For her. That's like her plan <laughs> B. But nevertheless, it's, it's a really humane article. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of lay, she lays out the fallacies we all live with, like, if I just worked a little bit harder, this would all be fine. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really love about it, and it's a thing I tried to do in my own book, is to say, this is not on you. There are great, big, structural things in society mm -hmm. that make this really hard. And I think in Canada, one of them is just that we don't have state-subsidized daycare. Mm -hmm. And if we had state-subsidized daycare... <laughs> This would all look a lot different. And you can just look at, at the Nordic, the Scandinavian countries for some evidence on that one. Um, but anyway, if, if people just have time to read the 20-page article in The Atlantic, it's online, Anne-Marie Slaughter, uh, I think it will make them feel a lot better. <laughs> feel better. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is for everything other than the time when your kids are little, mm -hmm. for everything else, life is long. Mm -hmm. It is. There, there's a lot of time out here. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the other thing is, is women should give themselves a, a little bit of slack on that front. That if there's something you really have to walk away from right now, there's going to be a lot of time to get back to it. Still going to be there. <laughs> Still going to be there for you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jane. Do you have any other uh, final thoughts or messages, kind of open floor time that... Um, 
you would like to share with anybody or did we uh, kind what of I would through? really say in in all jurisdictions everywhere wherever this message may go <laughs> is we all need to get out there and vote yes if you live in a democracy for God's mm-hmm. sakes get yourself informed and get out there and vote. There is nothing more important to the future of our children. One of the things that I just loved a little while ago, somebody uh, was talking about, if you look at the history of the suffrage movement and what women in particular, but all kinds of disenfranchised groups went through to win the right to vote, Mm -hmm. the idea that anybody who has got the right to vote is just going to stay home Mm -hmm. is beyond crazy just beyond crazy and I think it's one of those things that people don't realize how extraordinary in the course of human history Mm -hmm. democracy really is absolutely well thank you so much for taking the time Jane I know I ate into your time more than I promised (laughs) you're having a, a wonderful discussion you're an extremely extremely interesting person to talk to so I can't I can't uh, I can't stop but I'm going to stop taking up your time that you have so generously shared with me thank you so much for all of your insight and um we're actually going to be probably putting together a little empowerment package of books that we're going to be giving away to some of our listeners and uh, I was wondering if you would be okay with um us taking the resilient woman and adding it oh, as uh, one of our giveaway absolutely books. i would be thrilled that would be just great anyway it's been a real pleasure speaking with you <laughs> thank you so much have a nice evening okay bye for now bye <laughs> Hey Alphas, it's Dr. Antonella from Fierce and Flawless, The Female Project. I cannot wait to bring you more incredible stories and exceptional insights from women who made an impact. So join me on this journey. Subscribe and comment with nominations for guests you would like featured next. I want to deliver content that ignites a spark in you. So your feedback is extremely important to me. To connect with me and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.thefemaleproject.net or add me on Instagram at dr.antonella. Thank you for listening and stay tuned.